Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is November uh, 20th, 2018. It is very early in the morning. It's 714 in the morning. And we are uh, here under somewhat sad circumstances. We have brought Bill Real back to Mormon Stories Podcast for at least the fourth time, uh, this time under under the sad news that um, Bill Real, former Mormon bishop, former current Mormon bishop, Bill Real, um, uh, is has been summoned to a disciplinary council. Uh, he is set to be excommunicated um, on November 27, 2018 in St. George at 8.30 p.m. And uh, as we've tried to do on Mormon Stories podcast, we've tried to interview uh, everyone who um, is being faced with the disciplinary council for apostasy. So we, you know, we interviewed uh, Denver Snuffer, we interviewed Kate Kelly, we interviewed um, Marisa and Carson Calderwood. Um, you know, we interviewed Jeremy Runnels, we interviewed Sam Sam Young, and there have been many, many others who uh, have been disciplined over the years. Bill Real is the next um, in a long line. Bill Real is a podcaster. Uh, he podcasts for a podcast called uh, Mormon Discussions, right, Bill? Yeah, Mormon Discussion Podcast. Mormon Discussion Podcast. And he's been doing this for quite some time. And uh, we've had him on Mormon Stories several times. I think Bill Reel's very first appearance on the Mormon Internet was back in 2012 when he interviewed with Mormon Stories Podcast as the first sitting bishop to interview on Mormon Stories back episodes 363 and uh, 364. Uh, that feels like an eternity ago, doesn't it, Bill? Been a long, long time, John. <laughs> uh, he came back on in 2015 to discuss his uh, split with Mormon apologists. And then he came back just last year in August to talk about his evolution. Um, some have been expecting uh, this uh, disciplinary council for many, many years. I know I have, and it's finally here. Uh, so it's with... Uh, it's with much regret and sadness, having been through an excommunication, that we have you back under these circumstances, Bill. But uh, in any event, uh, welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast. Yeah, I think that I've been on as many times as maybe John Hamer, right? Like, I think we're tied for the lead. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, this is your fourth, so. Okay. And I'm guaranteed a fifth visit, right? Sure. Yeah, okay. if you want to come back and talk about <laughs> uh, your disciplinary council. How this all love... goes. Yeah, how this all goes down. Yeah. All right, so um, we, we're broadcasting very early at 7.17 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we, we welcome those who are joining us live. We do want to incorporate your questions and comments. We feel like that makes a more interesting um, meeting. So please do, listeners. Uh, number one, please share this on your walls, uh, viewers and listeners on Facebook, on social media, Instagram, Twitter. It would be cool to get a live audience for this. Um, we want to give uh, Bill Real as much exposure as we did Sam Young and others. So please do share um, if you don't mind. Um, and we also just invite you to, to add your questions and comments as well. All right. So Bill Real, um, anything you want to say at the very beginning before I jump into my questions? No, no. I'm just excited to be on and to have a chance to kind of talk about what's all led up to this and what's going on behind the scenes with it. Okay, well, uh, we're going to try and go for about two two hours, two hours and fifteen minutes, but let's back up a bit. Um, <clears throat> Bill, as as people know, you converted to the church in your early adulthood. You uh, became a bishop at age twenty nine. Is that right? A Mormon yeah, bishop? Yeah, twenty nine years old. And that was in uh, Ohio. Uh, I don't want to, you know, restate your whole story because listeners can just go back and listen to that. Um, some of our past episodes. Um, but let's just suffice it to say you served four years as bishop. You uh, you started having doubts and questions during that time. Is that right? Yeah. Um, doubts and questions all along the way from 17 years old to when my shelf falls at 32. But I was also ingrained in apologetics as well. And a lot of those answers worked for a while until I understood the issue more deeply. Yeah. So, um so questions all along the way. Let's just start maybe in terms of your faith crisis. Um, what, when did that, for those who, who haven't listened, what were kind of the main issues and what was the trajectory of your faith crisis? Uh, so, yeah. 
Take us so, from the starting point. Yeah, sure. So um, 17 years old, I, even before I joined the church, I read No Man Knows My History by Fawn Brody. I, I understand, you know, there's some treasure digging. There's this book of Abraham issue. Uh, we, we weren't solid on this race and priesthood, although that was an evolution because um, I had a father-in-law who taught me that, yeah, these people of color were cursed. They were less valued in the premortal life. So it wasn't until later on when I start to see the church is kind of backtracking with the gospel topic essay on that particular issue. But I knew that like there were seer stones. Um, I knew there were issues with polygamy and there were accusations on Joseph's character. Again, I knew all the issues, but I knew them from such a surface level. And I'm reading apologetics from day one. And so when somebody says like, hey, don't worry about masonry being in the temple because that goes back to the temple of Solomon, those simple answers worked really well. And it's not until... I start to, you know, I'm older, my brain is becoming uh, developing, I'm, I'm entering some, you know, I'm leaving a little bit of ethnocentricity behind, I'm entering what you know well as the stages of faith, and um, as I leave that, uh, that binary world and I start to see there's messiness, I start to deconstruct these issues and get into the actual details of them, and so again, at 32 years old, I just wake up one morning and I realized two things. One is that, wow, these issues don't add up as smoothly as the apologist wants you to think, number one. And number two, my church intentionally mistold the story in order to have people believe in a narrative that simply doesn't hold up to the data. Yeah. So you asked to be released uh, as, as bishop. How did your... Uh, you know, interactions with your leaders progress from that point. To today. So, yeah. So from the very beginning, I'm in full in, I'm serving as a Bishop. I have this faith crisis. I reach out to elder Holland. Um, he, how'd you, how'd you reach out to Holland? So I'm a Bishop. So I go on to LDS.org. I sign in, I find the leadership directory. I go right to the top and I find his email and he's the guy. I liked his charisma. Um, I liked his personality. And I felt like if anybody would be willing to, to take a moment and spend some time with this, it was him. I hadn't even told my wife yet about my faith crisis. You know how this goes. We're all scared to death to tell anybody. And it's, now it's a little better. But if you go back to even 2012, John, very few people even know about Mormon stories. And so on some level, there's nobody that even knows somebody else in their ward or their stake that's swimming in these waters. And so you feel so alone. And so before I told anybody else as a sitting bishop, I reached out to Elder Holland um, and he ended up contacting Marlon Jensen, uh, who was church historian at the time. And Marlon uh, reaches out to me and I talked to him for about 45 minutes on the phone. Um, and then we have, phone. yeah. And then we have two or three emails back and forth. What did Marlon say? Uh, essentially. Like, can I, I just say, sure. it's super, you know, th there was this joke that you and I have both seen and I'll just say it because it's funny. As uh, as Bill Real is, yeah. John Dillon once was. As John Dillon is, Bill Real may become. Um, and the only reason I bring that up is because there's so many parallels. I had a personal meeting with Marlon Jensen. I had a personal, two personal meetings with Elder Holland. Uh, I had a podcast before you. Like the some of the similarities are really uncanny. Um, yeah. so I'm just going to state that up front. So and, and let, me, let me say oh, too, John. It, it also it's funny from that perspective, and there are those connections, but it also diminishes the fact that this is real growth and development, right? Like you leave a binary world, you leave dualistic thinking, you become more aware of nuance, you become more well of your inner authority, you no longer look to the outer authorities of your tribe as having the ultimate answers, and as you deconstruct your religion, you become deeply aware that it's myth. And so as that process happens, it's easy for the TBM or the Orthodox member on the inside to say like, oh yeah, that guy used to believe and now he doesn't. And he's just like that other guy. The reality is that there are thousands upon thousands of Mormons and there are millions of people in the world going through this developmental process. And many of them are, and most of them maybe, are deconstructing their religious paradigms and looking at it as myth. So it also diminishes people too, to simply label it as that simple kind of, as one person is, the other person's going to be just like them. Yeah, in fact... I would I, I I only mention it as a joke, but but the truth is in science, 
if there's a study that's been conducted um, and then somebody makes a, a replication of that study, it actually serves as an additional witness. So, of course, the church is familiar with the idea of multiple witnesses. The church has ba banked its credibility on multiple witnesses. And the fact that you would go through a very similar path and and reach a very similar conclusion, uh, it, it was a very independent journey. You and I have not spent a lot of time hanging out or talking over the years. Your independence been your your journey has been very independent from mine. And yeah. for me, it, it serves as a second witness to, or a third or a fourth or a tenth or a hundredth witness to the problems that are out there. Yeah, and every person who's sitting right now looking at this, uh, this video and watching this or listens to this podcast later, they've gone through this exact same process as well. So it, it's, not, it's diminishing to make it sound like, yeah, he's just like that other guy. The reality is we're all just developing and growing. And what that means is we leave behind the literal belief of our faiths. Yeah. Okay, so Marlon Jensen, he's the one. Now, this would have been in 2012 that you talked to Marlon? Uh, yeah, 2012. So uh, he was so still a general authority at the time and still yeah, chief historian. Yeah, I believe this so. This was before the essays had been come out. It was probably Correct. after I had met with Marlon personally. Correct. Yeah, I believe okay. it was. So Elder Jensen essentially tells me um, the, the standard response, which is, I don't have any good answers for any of your questions. And I've followed up with Marlon, by the way. I had an email conversation with him maybe a year ago or so. And it's the same story. We don't have any answers, but I love you. And I love this faith and I've had some experiences. And so if you hold on to the other side, it'll all work itself out. The reality is, man, the, the unhealthiness here is so deep that to just wait it out to the other side just feels like a slap in the face in some ways. Um, Elder Jensen offered his love and I, and I felt that was sincere. I think he's a deeply caring human being. And I think he cares about those who go through this process, but what it comes down to is whether this works or doesn't work, and the facts are deeply against the, the claims the church makes about its stories and its foundational truth claims and its narrative. Um, and you can see that changing right before our eyes as this new Saints pro, uh, book comes out. The uh, I got finished up with Marlon. It was about a 45-minute conversation. Again, a couple hey, of I just have to say forward. it's sure. remarkable that someone who knows church history, who studied it for as long, who sat at the top of church history, a department for, for as long as he did, who oversaw the creation of the essays, who had unrestricted access to all the, the vaults and everything. And he has no not answer. able was yeah. not able to provide answers. Uh, Think about that. The church okay. historian, the yeah. top guy, the, you know, on the hierarchy of church history, he's the guy who oversees all of it. He has access to everything, as you point out, and he doesn't have a single good answer for any of this. Yeah. So he basically just leaves you with, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't help you or, Keep the faith. Um, yeah, keep the faith. We love you. Church is true. But uh, yeah, I can't answer any of your questions. These are real issues. Everybody's struggling with these that reaches out to me, and I don't have a way to solve it. That's okay. the gist. Okay. Um, Elder Holland follows up with me about two months later. What does that mean? What do you mean he followed up? So Elder Holland, originally, he's the guy I reach out to. He has Elder Jensen reach out to me. He then, a month or two later, um, has his secretary call me at work. And, and the secretary gets on the line and says, I've got Elder Holland on the line. Can you take a phone call? So I'm on my cell phone. I go back to a, a private room at my uh, workplace in Ohio. And I have a conversation with Elder Holland via the telephone. And we also had follow-up conversations by email. Well, Elder what's Holland's that like? I, I, I've talked to Elder Oaks and, and Elder Holland. What was that like to talk to Elder Holland uh, directly? Man, part of... Um, the solution at the time is the fact that somebody simply validates you and yeah. is making a safe space for you to express the fact that this isn't, this isn't, uh, the dots aren't connecting the way you thought they were. And so that was very soothing at the time, right? Here's an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's telling me it's okay that I'm having a faith crisis, um, that that doesn't diminish me in any way. So that's beautiful. Uh, the trouble is he's also offering the same answer, which is, I don't have any answers. The church is true, warts and all, but, uh, and that's an exact quote from him during that phone call. But there are, there, he doesn't have any way to put any of this back together. It's just hold on, uh, have faith, um, trust in those experiences that you've had, and this will work itself out on the other side. And how does that feel to kind of go to the top? It's all, for me, when I met with Holland, it was like going to Oz and then peering behind the curtain and seeing that they had no good answers. That, that was ultimately very disappointing for me because if Holland doesn't know, 
you know, he's younger. He's been to Yale. He's been to a, a pretty good school. He's read a few books, as he says. If Holland doesn't know, does anyone know uh, what, any good answers to these problems? Yeah, it did two things. The, the emotion of it was soothing. So it allowed me to slow down a little bit. It allowed me to probably stay um, more believing for a longer period of time. Uh, but yes, the other thing happened as well, which is that you've now talked to the church historian, uh, a general authority. You've now talked to a special witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you now realize that there, there just isn't never, there's never going to be good answers for these questions. They don't exist. Um, and you have to come to terms with that. Yeah. Okay. So you get done with Holland and you're feeling like there's no good answers. What does that leave you with? So as time goes on, I'm, I'm continually thinking about Mormonism. I mean, if you know me, if you ask my friends, you'd, you'd essentially know that I'm always reading something. I'm always thinking about something. I'm always trying to find one more detail, one more fact, something that no one else knows. And so as I dive into these issues, I, I, I'm just continually, it's this slow, fluid process of continually learning that this is not only messier than you thought it was on the is, issues you knew, but you're also always learning new things. Um, and as you learn new things, you realize like, oh, wow, that's messy too. Um, and so as time goes on, I become more willing to kind of put my foot down and not let these guys just being nice, smooth it over. So as I'm continually reaching out to Elder Holland, things are happening. Elder Bednar, a few years back in general conference, reiterated that Jesus was born on April 6th. I know that's not true. I know the history behind why we made that claim, and I know that where it's founded in is, is not based in a uh, historical or accurate way of posing that as a truth. So I reach out to Elder Holland and I say, what is up with this? Elder Bednar just told us in general conference that Jesus was born on April 6th. Here's the data. We know that's not true. Elder so you're Holland, having email exchanges with Elder Holland? Yeah, regarding Elder Bednar teaching false doctrine in uh, general conference. Okay. That's pretty cool. I'm actually surprised he's willing to engage with you on that stuff. Yeah, and that's about the time it ends because he begins to perceive that I'm no longer just going to accept nice, nice conversation as satisfactory. So as I start to put my foot down and say, like, I have real questions, and the logic of these questions walks us out to knowing that this doesn't add up. Like, can you answer this stuff? Um, so I begin asking him things like, how much do guys, how much do you guys make? Um, how, what is the details of how you guys are called? Uh, have you ever seen Jesus? Um, are we going to start teaching a different history? Cause our history doesn't add up. And very quickly it gets to the point where he no longer responds to my messages. Um, yeah. So that, when we interviewed Hans Matson, uh, you know, originally Hans was promised, I believe by elder Perry, that he was going to get some book that was going to yeah, nail briefcase you know, yeah, book in his briefcase that was going to nail, yeah. you know, the, the ex-Mormons and the apostates. How's that working? Going to nail them. Yeah, um, not working so good. What's that? I said, that's not working so good, is it? There's no such thing. Yeah, yeah. But but the but the thing that Hans said is, all Hans did is he waited for this book to come out. He never, he thinks it was rough stone rolling, but he, but he never actually heard back from Elder Perry about you know, what, what book came out or what was it or, and, and, but when he tried to ask Elder Perry and follow up and ask what the book was, uh, he was, it was made very clear to him that they don't like it when you ask them questions. Yeah. It's kind of the story of Mormonism, right? Like I've got some magical thing in my back pocket that I can't show you, but at some point, if you just hang on long enough and have enough faith sooner or later, you'll get a chance to experience it. Yeah. Yeah. So that must, so what was it like when Holland kind of stopped communicating with you? How'd that make you feel? Um, in some ways it was actually validating because I realized that he had run out of tricks. He had run out of things to appease me. And now it was down to the actual data and the details and he knew he had lost. And so he had backed off. So where is your testimony at this point? Uh, you know, where you've talked to Jensen, you've talked to Holland and you've just discovered they don't have answers. Have you had you stopped believing by this point? Was it nuanced? Was it progressive? What? Well, where was your testimony at that point? It would have been um, realizing that most of this doesn't add up, and leaving space that there still might be something to it. Right? There might still, you know, Joseph Smith may have had an experience that the church is now operating from the position of just managing that. 
and uh, that God literally never steps into the room anymore to talk to these guys. Okay. So sort of uh, there are many paths at Mount Fuji. The Mormon church may be true, may not be true, but there may be goodness in it. And this is my tribe kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, that would have been what I would have held then. That would I would have tried to have hold on. Like I wanted to be Mormon. I still do. Yeah. Like, this is my tribe, right? Like we can get into this. This is my tribe and I want to be Mormon. And yet it's not my fault that the story doesn't add up. It's not my fault that the facts don't lead to a way of putting this back together in a way that you go, yeah, all right, that makes sense. I believe again. Like that's yeah. not my fault. That's not right. my problem. Sure. Okay, so – Holland st- stops communicating with you. Then what happens? Um, at that point, I realized like I'm out of options there. So I, uh, in 2014, there's the fireside in Henderson, Nevada that I'm at. Uh, the owners of Family Pond, which is where I work, they're at that fireside. And uh, after that fireside was over, they reach out to me to take a job in Southern Utah um, I, I'm really quiet with my stake president in Ohio because I could tell he wasn't a safe space to talk about this. When I get to Southern Utah, uh, I'm living in Santa Clara, which is on the Northwest side of St. George. And, I, I, while I'm there, I send a letter to the top 15, about half of them. I picked out who I thought were the nicer, more receptive of those top 15 And I sent a letter to them essentially saying, you've got a major issue on your hand. You've got five problems. And I don't remember what all five were, but it was history, LGBT, feminism, um, the fact that prophets don't produce any real revelation, prophecy, seeing, none of that. Uh, And I don't remember what the fifth one was, but I said, you've got these five things coming at a head right now. And you've got to deal with all five of these. And I'm just some nobody, uh, but here's how I would handle those five which I thought was pretty cocky, but in some ways I wanted them to be aware, like this isn't going away. These are real issues. And uh, about two weeks later, my stake president reaches out to me and says, uh, I'd like to meet with you. So I go sit down with my stake president, nice guy. He actually helped us find our home in Santa Clara. And he said, look, the, I'm going to be honest with you. The brethren sent your letter back to me and uh, they think you're an apostasy. And it's my responsibility to evaluate that. And so we sit down over the course of, I don't know, three, four, five meetings. And he uh, reads, I, I, I asked a bunch of listeners to send in letters, just being honest about their experience with me and with the podcast and, and whether I had a positive or negative effect on them. And about 25 letters came in. I gave them all to my stake president. He read every one of them, he said. And he comes back and says, Bill, I've read those letters and I just don't think you're an apostasy. And so my entire time in Santa Clara, he, It was, you're making us all uncomfortable, but you haven't done anything wrong. And uh, he left it alone. Uh, At that point, I bought a, we bought a house in Washington, which is on the southeast side or maybe the uh, northeast side of uh, St. George. I'm still kind of getting used to where things are at. Um, Bought a home in Washington and uh, moved into a new ward. At this point, I should probably go back a moment. About a month before we bought this house, it's December Uh, of last year. And it gets to the point where when I go to church, uh, I'm getting headaches and my hands are shaking. And as people say the nonsense that Orthodox members say at church, when they retell the stories that aren't true, when they spout anti LGBT rhetoric, when they impose ideas that simply just don't hold up, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm kind of a challenger. And people, you mean, obviously everybody knows that I, so I raise my hand and I'll say, Hey guys, that just isn't accurate. The story you just told doesn't hold up to the data. Um, Or, Hey, we shouldn't be talking about people that way. We're not as uh, informed as we think we we are. And there's lots of issues around gender or sexuality that are complex. And as I would stand up to these people and I'm again, no offense to them, but I'm, I'm more well-read. I'm, I'm more informed. I get that they believe in something and my beliefs are one off from where they're at, but I'm sharing with them actual data. And these people would get loud and they would cut me off and they would say, Hey, we're just not going to go there today. Or um, they would couch their answers in a way to keep me from being able to respond to them. And so by the time I go home on Sundays, like I'm a mess and I would have trouble sleeping. And, and so my body is now presenting this trauma that comes from pushing against 
the unhealthiness of Mormonism, it's expressing itself. And so in December of last year, I roll over, look at my wife on Sunday morning, and my wife is already disconnected from the faith. My kids are already disconnected. They're all going because I want to go. Um, my kids are leaving after sacrament. We say, hey, just go to sacrament. You guys can go home after that. Um, it's to the point where everybody doesn't want to be there. And I'm the only one trying to get us to go. And I roll over and say, I just can't do it anymore. I'm done. So in December of last year, we quit going. We move into a new house. When we move into a new house, I reach out to the new bishop. He doesn't really say much. I'm asking him questions. I've got one daughter, by the way, who's bisexual. And so I'm not, that obviously changes how you approach church. And so I tell the bishop and the stake president, if this isn't a safe place for my daughter to be, there's not even a chance of me considering being active in this area. And all he responds back with is, hey, our meeting started at 11 a.m. He doesn't even address the issue. Um, and, and so that tells me right away, this isn't a safe space. The stake president doesn't respond at all, doesn't reach out to me at all. Uh, about a month later, maybe three weeks later, that stake president is released and a new stake president is called. Do you know how long he had served? Uh, it, it was, I'm, I'm assuming he had served his full time. I think he was released honorably and I don't think it had anything to do with my move there. I think it was just the normal process of things. Okay. Um, the new stake president is called. I reach out to him. Uh, he says, look, I'm new. I'll get to you when I get to you. And it's probably four months or something before I get a first contact from this guy. And so now he says, he asked me to come in and, and actually he comes to my home and he brings the Bishop with him. And, um, they sit down in my house and I've got two friends of mine there. And so there's my wife, me, my two friends and the stake president and the Bishop. And what month and, is this? This would have been... Uh, approximately I'm going to guess probably we've been in our home now, probably eight months. So probably four months ago. Okay. So we're talking June, -ish, uh, maybe? July ish. Yeah. Okay. And so he reaches out to me the first time he's in my house and I had put a bunch of questions on Facebook that day and said, Hey, I'm meeting with my stake president. These are the questions that point to the unhealthiness of Mormonism and the fact that things don't add up. These are things I'd like answers to. He comes into my home and says, somebody sent me your questions. I don't know if it was the Strengthening Church Members Committee. I don't know if it's um, another member on Facebook who happened to know me. But he says, I'm not going to answer your questions. I don't have answers for them. I don't know the history. So he admits uh, again, your stake president admits he has no answers to you. Right. He, um, he that says, should be an immediate get out of excommunication card if the church can't answer the right. question. Right. Uh, that's the thing, John. I've never said no any grounds for apostasy. <laughs> yeah. I've never said anything that's untruthful. Nobody's ever come to me along this whole way and said, Bill, you said ABC and it doesn't hold up. Here's why. Nobody's ever done that. Um, he also says that Salt Lake's been calling him once a month and telling him what I've done over the last 30 days. So I'm not sure why it took him so long to get to me, but he has this one meeting with me. He said, I can't answer your questions. He says, you really have three choices. My friend at the house, um, and you've met my friend, Chris Bloxham. So my, my buddy's at the house, and, uh, and he says, uh, you know, Bill's always worried that telling the truth is going to get him in trouble. And, and my state president says, yeah. I said, he goes, it's getting to the point where you're going to have basically three options. You have the option to soften up and stop doing what you're doing. You have the option to resign. Uh, or the third option is this ends with you being excommunicated. And... Uh, that meeting, essentially, we, we spent several hours talking, but that's the gist of it. So the, we, first, the first condition was to stop the podcast. Is that right? Yeah, stop the podcast or soften up considerably. Okay. Because that's for me, that's what it was. It was take the podcast down, take any episode in the past down that challenges the church, and stop speaking out publicly in any way about the church. Yeah. Nobody specifically said you have to stop the podcast or you have to remove these things. Oh, yeah. I think that's something they learned from dealing with you and others in the past is to not specifically ask somebody to do something, but li simply leave it in their court and suggest that something has to change. So it's so that you, you were given conditions to escape a disciplinary council and that was chill out and soften up. Yeah. Or resign or, or resign. Okay. Um, so that meeting essentially ends. How, did you respond to the, to the request? Uh, no, I told him, I, I was point blank with him. I said, I'm not going to soften up. I said, unless you can, you, I'm said, I'm welcome. If you want to tell me where I've been dishonest, if you want to tell me where I've been inaccurate, 
I'm happy to do that. At that night, we talked about Elder Holland's comment um, that I've used in the podcast even recently, where Elder Holland says, we have staggering growth. The most growth we've had since Adam and Eve walked out of the garden. Double-digit state creation every week of our lives. Now, when you look at the data, the church itself says we create between about 50 and 70 stakes a year. Um, that's 1.15 uh, to 1.7 stakes a week. And even if you go to a month, that's not double digits. So we know it's dishonest. We know it's inaccurate. Um, my stake president, when I shared that with him, because that's one of the things he was told was uh, Salt Lake had called and they were not happy. It was not sitting well that Bill Reel had called Elder Holland a liar. Okay, so let's back up. When did, sure. when did Elder Holland say that? I think this was back in 2014, but Radio Free Mormon and I had had a conversation about it somewhat recently, and we each, he had done an episode called Lies, Damn Lies, and Statistics. And, uh, and I had put out a post where I lay out point by point the data of Elder Holland's comment, show you where you can see what the actual uh, data was, and you can see that he's not telling the truth. Why did you care so much about that? Why was that issue... Number one, Elder, the, the substance of his lie, which is trying to communicate that the church is growing abundantly without end, and then the fact that he's lying, why were those two things such a problem for you, even four years after he said it? If I, I guess the simple answer is I think integrity matters. And every step of the way, John, I've tried to, I've tried to act with integrity. And I've tried to be honest and vulnerable when people ask questions, I answer them. I don't deflect. I don't, I don't try to skip the question and answer something else. I try to be forthright. And those things are important to me. And so when you talk to my friends, and again, you know my friends. You've met with them. Yep. You ask my friends, they'll say, Bill's, Bill's he's, he's transparent. He's got integrity. And he'll tell you like it is, and he'll take any question. So this church has built itself into, into what it claims is 16 million members worldwide based on a story that has been inaccurate and deceptively told at every single turn. The data points demonstrably at that. And these leaders feel like they have a free pass to embellish and tell stories at every turn that don't hold up. And enough's enough. We live in an internet age now, John. I think they're learning the hard way, but that's just not gonna hold up anymore. They're gonna have to tell things accurately and they're going to have to back off the stuff that doesn't hold up. And you have to know that there's this idea as long, you know, I was able to go 10 years with Mormon stories podcast without getting excommunicated. One thing I never did or tried to never do was like directly criticize the brethren because I knew from the very beginning from 2005, that that will get you excommunicated, you know, criticize, criticizing the brethren or, you know, publicly denouncing the church's truth claims in a way that's sort of final or categorical. So you, you realize that when you were going after Holland and calling him a liar, that, that you were probably inviting an excommunication. Is that fair to say? I knew that the church had set itself up in a way as to shield itself from members pointing and shining a light on its deceptiveness. And I knew that such could not go unpunished, yes. On the other hand, what does that say about an institution when the guy who lies gets to keep doing what he's doing and the guy who shines a light on it has to stand before people and be judged and excised from his tribe. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's condemning. So, so my state president, Holland. so the first was the radio free Mormon episode. Then your part in that was what? Putting a post on Facebook where I lay out the data as there's just no debate. Either elder Holland has to, make up a story about being misinformed. But see, here's the trouble. You have to understand the background. Elder Holland says he got this information from his Thursday meetings in Salt Lake. In other words, he goes to the meeting with all the other brethren and they're deciding, they're praying and they're deciding the stakes to create. For him to say like, oh, I was just misinformed. Somebody gave me a bad number. That doesn't hold up. The guy's in the very meeting every single week where stakes are created. He knows roughly how many stakes every week, week in and week out for a decade that he's been an apostle for, for 15 years that he's been an apostle. He knows how many stakes the church is creating unless he's taking naps 
and letting somebody else tell him what's going on in the meetings that he's present for, we know he's not telling the truth in this instance. So as so, I put that post, oh, go ahead. Was that the liar, liar post or was there a different one? Uh, it was a original post with his face and with a, um, a stamp on it that said liar. And it was just on this one issue. That's and pretty so, bold though. I know. That's pretty know, bold. But it's also true. <laughs> and so if you can't tell the truth, if I thought when I joined Mormonism as a 17 year old, I thought I found the kingdom of God on earth. And I thought integrity was what was I, like honesty and integrity and charity and compassion and kindness. Those things mattered. And, and, and now as you learn, that's not really what's important. Loyalty and obedience is what's important. Um, in the meeting with the state president in my house, I shared these, this data. And as I shared that data, he even says, like, it looks like he's lying. It looks like Elder Holland's not telling the truth. I don't know why he would do that. And my state president, in a sense, was confounded. He couldn't, he had these two things. One was it looked like Elder Holland was lying. And yet he held this belief that that wouldn't make sense. Like Elder Holland wouldn't lie. And he couldn't reconcile those himself. Um, so again, that meeting comes to an end. Uh, a lot of time goes by, I don't know, another month. And my stake president reaches out and meets with me again. And my wife is at the meeting, just the two of us with him. And it's the same story. I can't answer your questions. I can't reconcile your concerns. The church isn't happy about you pointing at these things, but I don't have any good answers for them. Yes, it looks like Elder Holland was lying. The other thing I asked him to do in this process, and I'm sorry, I'm being kind of back and forth. Um, he said, there's got to be a better way to get answers to your questions. I said, great, let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. He goes, there's, there's a, I said, let me guess. The process is you send things up and somebody addresses it. He goes, yep. I said, wonderful. Let's try that. I said, I'll pick five questions, John, and let's send those five questions up. Um, and I don't know if you want to copy and paste those questions, maybe into the Facebook feed, or if you want to go over them, we can do that too. They're long. Because as you know, let, let me, let me, I'll, I'll paste them in, but uh, I'll, I'll just read it. <laughs> so one is about LGBTQ members, right? And homosexuality, same sex sexuality. Right? Yeah. But, but I'm forming the argument based on if guys like elder Oaks or elder Nelson, if their first wife passes away and they've checked all the boxes, what's their reason for needing to remarry? And the only reason to remarry, if you're an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's received all the ordinances, you've been married once in the temple, you've had the second anointing, is that you're lonely and you want to have relationship. And if an apostle of the Lord who's checked all the boxes is lonely and wants to have a relationship, then how dare we tell our LGBT members that they're to sit alone for the rest of their lives? Um, and that's the only way they can get back to heaven and get back to God. It makes no sense. Um, so that was the first question. It's also an acknowledgement that they believe in polygamy and that they practice celestial yeah. polygamy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, pay, I pasted the questions in. What's the second one? Uh, let's pull it up here. You. Okay. The second one uh, is on past doctrines of race. So the Lowry Nelson stuff, talk about that. Uh, just the idea that um, prophets in the past have declared that certain things we know now to be false were doctrine. Somewhere along the way, somebody sorted out, somebody sorted out which, which things we can disavow and which things we can't. And yet Jesus has never come into the room at all and said like, yeah, you can keep that one, but you can throw this one out. The reality is these guys are just guessing. And when things get too uncomfortable, then they disavow it. Um, but as long as it can be mildly comfortable, they leave room for it to stay. And it's just a, it's just a cat and mouse game. So the question essentially walks them into the logic of that. So you're, it, it wasn't just the issue of racism. It's the issue of who's leading this ship. How can it be that our, in a, that our first presidency 50 years ago can state that the black priesthood ban is doctrine? And then through an essay, they can say, oh, past statements were wrong and misinformed. There's no accountability for how these decisions are made. And, and God can't be changing. So if God's not changing, it means first presidency and quorum of the 12 got it wrong, but where's the acknowledgement that they're getting it wrong. If, if elder Oaks at the 40th anniversary uh, of the 78 revelation or 50, whatever that was, if he, if when he stood up, he uh, articulated a talk that still said like, Hey, the ban was still from God, but the reasons behind the ban weren't. And, Elder Oaks talked about his spiritual impressions around that. The problem is his spiritual impressions mean nothing 
because he's automatically telling you the spiritual impressions of the past leaders. They meant nothing. So if one leader acknowledges the, the leader in the past with the same stewardship, the same authority, the same access, can believe with all of his heart that he has an impression from the Holy Ghost, only to be thrown under the bus by a later leader, then how can I trust that later leader that his impressions by the Spirit are any more accurate? It's, it's just a, it's a broken system. There's yeah. no way to know when God talks and when he doesn't, even when they tell you God talks. Yeah. The, the, basically, all they can say is if, if my mouth is moving, I'm speaking for God. Whatever right. I'm or, saying or now, I'm alive, pay so it counts. Pay attention to what I'm saying now. Ignore anything that's ever been said in the past. I'm alive, and so it counts while I'm alive. And when I'm dead, somebody else can decide I'm, I'm not, it doesn't count anymore. Like, yeah. it's, just, it's just nonsense. Okay, the third point uh, was Joseph Smith's translation. Um, Right about the Book of Mormon. Talk about that point. Um, there's five things. There's five translation productions that Joseph Smith produced. We have the Book of Mormon, which everybody now acknowledges has a ton of 19th century material and more than we have explanations for. Richard Bushman's the front man on that. Um, we now look at things like the Late War, the First Book of Napoleon. We look at thematic theme or uh, yeah, th uh, thematic themes from like the View of the Hebrews. Um, there's just too much stuff from Joseph Smith's culture and milieu um, to discount the fact that the Book of Mormon, at a minimum, is at least a large part of Joseph Smith and his culture, and at a maximum, entirely Joseph Smith and his culture. The Book of Abraham, everybody knows the problems with that. Uh, Joseph claimed it was a translation off Egyptian papyri and everything, including the facsimiles and whatnot are translated wrongly and accurately. And the apologi the apologists who stand up for the book of Abraham are seen as uh, non-credible uh, by other Egyptologists outside of Mormonism. The book of Moses borrows heavily from Luke chapter four and Matthew chapter four. The book of Moses has exact phraseology and sentence structures from those books. Those books were supposed to have been historically written after the book of, Mo or book of Moses, if the book of Moses is historical. So now we know it isn't. The Joseph Smith translation. Wait, we wait, now wait. Know also, sure. also we, we now know through David Bakavoy that, that Mo there's no evidence that Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of yeah, the Old Testament. No. Yeah, that's so not why historical is it that the Old Testament itself doesn't have Moses. And we know that because in the Pentateuch, it, it talks about Moses' death. Right. So who wrote Genesis, you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? Who wrote those books, if not Moses? And it couldn't have been Moses because it talks about his death. So why is it that Moses is not writing the Pentateuch, but somehow he's writing the book of Moses? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, the moment you walk these questions out in their logic, it falls apart. Yeah. So the next one is the Joseph Smith uh, translation of the Bible, the JST. It is a direct borrowing, which is a nice way of saying plagiarism, from a contemporary source, which is Adam Clark's commentary in large part. So again, every one of these things is not what we claimed them to be in our Mormon narrative. And the last one is the Kinderhook Plates which was a complete scam that Joseph gets a few sentences in and for whatever reason, and we can, we can accept the apologetic argument. He comes to find out from God that it's not, that he's being scammed and he puts it aside or, or tries to translate it in a different way. And it's not working. That's fine. But the fact is all five translation productions are not what Joseph Smith thought they were. And they're not what Mormonism told us they were. Um, so that's the, that's the point in that question. So the translation problem. Yeah. Uh, Joseph is a translator problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The fourth is uh, polygamy. Fanny Alger. Uh, Fanny. Yeah. Fanny Alger is, is a big one, but I think the biggest one is Lucy Walker. Uh, Lucy Walker's mother dies. Uh, Joseph Smith comes into the picture, sends the dad on a mission. Wait, you just mentioned the problem with Fanny Alger is that Joseph She's is claiming to have been sealed to her before the sealing keys were restored. So how can he marry Fanny Alger? when there aren't sealing powers, right? And, and not just that, Joseph Smith has a problem with young girls working in his home, right? You've got the Partridge sisters, you've got Fanny Alger, you've got uh, the Lawrence sisters, uh, you've got Lucy Walker. I mean, when you start to look at all these things, every time Joseph Smith gets a teenage girl doing laundry in his house, he ends up married to her. Um, he ends up sealed to her. And we can debate sealings and marriages. That's just all apologetic games. The reality is Joseph enters what we would absolutely deem today 
as inappropriate relationships with young girls who are vulnerable to coercion in his home. And it looks like he's using the claims of God revealing polygamy as just a cover for his adultery, basically. Yeah, it sure looks that way. Yeah. The, the bigger story is Lucy Walker. So her, her mom dies. Her dad, Joseph Smith, says, come, look, I'll take care of your oldest kids. Uh, the youngest kids will put in other homes. We'll send you on a mission so that you can get away from all of this and put your mind back at ease and, and get over the death of your wife. And I'll take care of your kids as my own. So he takes the kids into his home. And then he tells the general public when he goes out with the Walker daughters, he says, these are my daughters. He refers to them as his children. He tells Lucy, Lucy records in her own journal he, that he took care of us uh, as if we were his children. Um, and then the problem is within a very short time, Joseph approaches Lucy Walker and proposes that she enter into a celestial marriage with him. Now, here's the trouble. You're put into um, a, a Sophie's choice, which is that I either have to believe in a God who is comfortable taking a father-daughter relationship and making it into a husband-wife relationship, or I have to accept that Joseph Smith lied. And neither one of those are acceptable choices. I won't accept either one of those. They're non-negotiable. That's not a God I want to put faith in, and that's not what I would call a prophet. So I'm stuck. So that, that makes the polygamy question. The Lucy Walker story makes the polygamy issue come right to the surface. And again, nobody's got an answer. Don't forget the fact that, you know, Emma becomes like the 22nd wife sealed to Joseph. So he's violating DNC 132. It's supposed to be your first wife that's sealed to you. He lies to Emma, keeps it from her until she's something like the 22nd wife sealed to him. And he even gets sealed to those, was it the sisters who then he has, because Emma's I'm like, okay, marriage. if I get to choose who you get sealed to, let me choose these two sisters. They had already been sealed to Joseph yeah. without Emma's knowledge. So Joseph perpetuates sort of this deception and has them real resealed to him in front of Emma to, uh, to not have Emma get mad at him. And that shows just incredible, uh, you know, duplicity and, and deceit, right? It, yeah. If you were to go ask Stephen Harper, Mark Ashurst, McGee, Matthew Groh, say, you know, tell that story and then say, did Joseph have fidelity to Emma? And the fact is he didn't. And those guys would either have to admit that or they'd have to dodge the question or, or somehow deflect from it. Yeah. So yeah, polygamy. All right. Fifth point, um, unhealthiness in the church. What do you mean by that? So when, when we, so not only do we go behind closed doors and ask kids sexual questions, which Sam Young has worked so hard to try and put an end to, but, but we have an untrained lay ministry. Like it's not, it's not, it's one thing and it's still wrong. It's one thing if I take a minister who goes to school and I teach him the ethics of being a minister, I teach him boundaries, I teach him safe practices, I teach him appropriate questions and why other questions aren't appropriate. What we do in Mormonism is we say, hey, I know you're a plumber from nine to five and nothing against plumbers. I know you're a plumber from nine to five, but now we've decided that you're going to go ahead and be the ecclesiastical leader of this congregation. And here's a handbook and there's no training. And even the training isn't training. I served as a bishop. I'd meet with my stake president. I'd meet with the other bishops. We'd have training meetings where we talked about how to get numbers up and be better home teachers, but nobody's talking about boundaries. Nobody's talking about uh, what's appropriate to ask kids and what's not. Nobody talks about the psychology of trauma and how you hurt someone or how you make their issues worse. So not only do you have one of the very few churches that is approaching young kids behind closed doors and asking questions of a sexual nature. You also have an untrained ministry who has no clue of how to navigate that space in any kind of a healthy way, even if you're going to still say, we still need to be able to do this. And that's just one of them. Um, when you look at uh, anti-feminism, anti-LGBT, when you look at any time someone doesn't fit the mold of Mormonism, the church has mechanisms that cause trauma. If you are a doubter, um, the church has sh mechanisms that shame and marginalize you. So anytime you don't fit the box, you get hurt. And anytime you do fit the box, there's still trauma being imposed on you as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just kind of a toxic culture that punishes, well, that, that is discriminatory against women, people of color, sexual minorities, et cetera, and hostile towards any thinkers who ask questions and aren't willing to defer and bow down to the authority. So it's a toxic culture. 
Yeah. In, in some ways, it is a white male European uh, good old boys club. Yeah. It's a, it's a toxic patriarchy that means well. <laughs> it means well. I Sometimes. believe that. But, Sometimes. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a corrupt structure. Yeah. So you send, you, what did you do with those five questions again, just to get back to the story? Yeah. So those five questions, I said, look, let's do this. I'll give you five questions and you pass them up and let's see what happens to those. He takes the five questions. He sends them on to a 70. I don't know who, but um, that 70 immediately sends them right back and says, we're not going to answer those. We're hmm. not going to touch those questions. In fact, it's your job to answer those questions, stake president. Now, let's, <laughs> let's be honest. A local leader answering questions that are about the collective church is impossible. He doesn't have a stewardship to do that. He doesn't know the history. And so when he meets with me the second time, he says, I sent your questions on. They're not going to answer them. I said, I told you. Told you they weren't going to answer them. He goes, they told me that I'm supposed to answer them, but I'm not going to answer them either because I don't even know I don't even know where to start with them. Um, so he's admitted there's no way to address these issues, no way to answer these questions. And he essentially touched base and said, look, they're still calling me every month. Uh, it's completely in my court. And, and I pushed him on that. This is one of the things I wanted to know because we all talk about in Mormonism that at some point this is taken out of the stake president's hands and the church comes in and imposes that a disciplinary court is to be held. Um, his correspondence with Salt Lake was that, yes, Bill is making us uncomfortable. Yes, we think he's an apostasy, but the decision is yours. And my stake president read the letter to me. I don't have a copy of it. I don't know the wording of it, um, but he read it to me. And it essentially said, it is in your court. You get to decide how this proceeds. But my stake president admitted, he goes, look, Bill, you've asked good questions. I don't have answers, but I'm a loyal guy to the church. And if the church tells me to excommunicate you, I'm going to excommunicate you. So I knew sooner or later it was going to happen. Um, that meeting, I'm trying to remember off the end if there was anything else important there. That meeting comes to a close. And now we're, again, we're another two months later. And I get an email from him that he wants to meet again. Okay, what month is this approximately? Oh, this would have been somewhat recent, maybe. Maybe three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. Okay. About a month um, ago. And I responded and said, just this, this is a burden. These meetings are draining. And you know this. These meetings, you, you just, you're wore out. Yeah. And so when this meeting is um, that he wants to set up, I essentially respond like, I, I'm not planning to meet with you unless you have something you want to meet about. And if you have something to meet about, then I will be happy to. And by the way, I still have this email and this is, I'm happy to share it. Um, I've cut and paste parts of it so that people can see that I have offered to meet. Uh, I said, I'm fully willing to meet, but I would like to know what we're going to meet about. And I'd like you to actually have a reason for meeting, not just to meet, to check the box because Salt Lake's asking you to meet with me. Um, so that happens. And he essentially responds, <clears throat> okay, fine. You know, and, and that's the end of the conversation. So it, I think, okay, no big deal. It's done. Um, then in the meantime, my episode, Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire comes out, which I, I know people are asking, like, why such the harsh total? Uh, the title, I mean. <clears throat> yeah, and, do you, and, I, and, and I know you've said that he is lying, and so that's why you're using the term liar. But you've got to know that, that, that using the phrase liar, liar, pants on fire to a Mormon apostle is just like basically saying, shoot me. It's, it's almost suicide by, by policemen. It's just like, <clears throat> uh, it's taunting them, begging for, for a disciplinary counsel. Is that fair or not fair? Um, <clears throat> I, I see, I wouldn't say it that way. What I would say is that this system has no healthy way for recourse. If you perceive somebody has wronged you, if you perceive the church is teaching something falsely, if you perceive that people are being marginalized for unnecessary reasons, the church has given you no healthy way to go back to the system and say, there's something wrong here. Can you please at least take a look at this and address it and have a conversation about whether my points are valid or not? They don't have that. So when I put out an episode like Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire, my point here is that this you've left me. You've left me with the only way to get your attention and to say, you're not doing something okay here. 
you're unhealthy and you need to fix it. And, uh, and, and obviously if it means I'm excommunicated, then so be it. But you could but, say you're unhealthy or the church yeah. has toxic culture saying elder Holland, you're a liar, 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 pants on fire. That's, that's different than saying church, your culture is dishonest and toxic, right? Um, if we had a system where people permitted you to have the soft conversation and for your concerns to actually be addressed, then I would agree with you. The only way you get the church's attention is when you begin to publicly point out its unhealthiness in ways it doesn't want you to. So it's a way to get the church's attention. Is that what you're saying? That title? Yeah, it, it's, it's the only way to get these guys to take notice. Okay. And you're trying to get, you don't think they were taking notice? Um, I think they're willing to live with it if they feel like you're not shaking people by sharing the truth with them. And they want you to couch it in the softest of terms, right? Like, like even, even the games they play where doubts are okay, but, or questions are okay, but doubts are bad. When we pose things in certain ways, we're, we're essentially saying like, if you have a, a question and that question leads you to being uh, more faithful in the church, that's good. But if you have a doubt and a doubt leads you to not being able to make these things add, add up, then that is bad. The church has all these mechanisms and it has no problem shaming you or marginalizing you. Um, and so I wanted to turn, turn this around a little bit and say, look, uh, you're doing something unhealthy. You've been dishonest on multiple occasions. By the way, that episode lays out using the audio from Elder Holland's own lips on five occasions of him being uh, demonstrably dishonest. Well, and, can you can you take us through some of the instances? Um, I've got it written somewhere. Yeah, give me two seconds here. I'll just type it in. And and what I'll do is I'll include a link to that as well. That's Mormon <clears throat> Discussions, episode 316, Elder Holland, Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. I'll paste that in the show notes. In the show notes, if you look at them. So the first one is Elder Holland claims to hold the very copy. Now, when you say very copy, you that me, that is understood to mean there is one copy and I'm holding it. The very copy of the Book of Mormon that Bathsheba, Hiram Smith's wife, had in her possession, from which Hiram Smith, the prophet's brother, read to her and had turned the very corner of the page down from where he read. The problem is that the church had talked about this story in the past, and they show pictures of the book, and you can see from the links that the two books are not the same. The book that Elder Holland holds up is a book in mint condition. The book in the link is rough and tattered. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. Number two, Elder Holland is asked about the church's contribution to Prop 8 um, at a college event. And he says the church did not give one red cent to the fight against same-sex marriage in California. The trouble is that we have documentation that the church did give donations. And at the very minimum, a, a significant amount um, of at least 200 grand in donations in kind. Now you can use the loophole and say, when I said one red cent, I meant cash. But the reality is he's trying to portray to people in a deceptive way that the church did not have any connection to that and did not give anything. The reality is the church gave quite a bit. Oh, can I just say, we, we've covered this on Mormon Stories for years. The church actually rented out office call banks in Provo and, and through their stakes, recruited BYU students to man the phone banks and call citizens of California to get them to vote for Proposition 8. And people very, very close to me, hundreds of people I've talked to, were called in by their stake presidents and asked to give money uh, to the Prop 8 campaign, very specifically and directly. So the church was shaking down members to get money, manning call banks, donating indirectly, um, somewhere around $40 million, I think, was totaled, given by Mormons at the request of the church to support Prop 8. So it is a very deceptive comment, indeed. Yeah. And let's go one step further. Thanks to Ryan McKnight and Mormon Leaks, we actually got a hierarchy chart. So the church said, no, 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 we have nothing to do with this. It's just local members and their own interest in this issue. And the reality is that once the... Uh, hierarchy chart was released, we could see that who the, the people on the ground were all the way up to Elder Ballard and other members of top leadership being involved directly in, in the fight against Prop 8. Yeah. Um, so that was a big lie. 
Number three, Elder Holland told that faith promoting story about the young missionary who goes out of his mission, goes to like Idaho, finds uh, this guy out in his front yard with some dogs and uh, uh, ends up talking to him. And this ends up being his own brother. And soon after the story is told, Radio Free Mormon and I are having a conversation the moment that story went out. And we both are on the phone with each other going, this story doesn't add up. There's too many embellishments. There's too many miracles. And, and so within about, I don't know, what was it? Maybe a week and a half or a week and maybe two weeks, that story is pulled back. The Deseret News pulled it. But here's the trouble. Um, if you started doing a search for that story, and I give the links to some of these stories, Elder Holland and other general authorities had been telling this story for three years. This isn't just something recent they picked up. This story had been told over a long period of time. It's only when the story made the Deseret News and the general public started going like, uh, that story doesn't hold up, that Elder Holland suddenly pulled it back. There's lots of holes. And you can go back to Radio Free Mormon's episode on this too, by the way, um, where he details the, the deception. I um, might have to look and see which one it is. And I can pull it up here in a second. But you can click the links. You can see where missionaries from three years ago talked about the story when Elder Holland and other leaders visited their mission. Um, this story isn't, it's just a made up story. It's a false faith promoting story and it simply has no truth. It's Radio Free Mormon episode 16, Make Way for Dodos um, is a good one. It's a really good one. Um, number four. Elder Holland, when asked directly whether Mitt Romney would have made penalty oaths in the temple, answers no. Of course, that we was know. on the BBC interview yeah. called Meet yeah. the Mormons uh, that was shown a long time ago, right? Yeah, and here's the trick when these guys sit down with somebody, they're always gauging what does the person across from me know, and let me frame my responses in a way that takes advantage of any ignorance or naivete that they have. This BBC guy, Elder Holland, underestimated him. Elder Holland assumed he could throw in an answer and that this guy would move on, except this guy had been prepped and he knew the next question to ask and how to do the follow-up. And Elder Holland ends up getting caught with his pants down, having lied about uh, Mitt Romney having taken penalty oaths in the temple prior to 1992 when he was endowed. So that's number, that's number four. And then number five, the final one, is the double-digit state creation every week of our lives. And so I take the cuts of audio from each of those, and I put them uh, in juxtapose with the data. And uh, when it's all said and done, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, but that Elder Holland seems to have a real issue with habitual lying. Yeah. And I, I met the guy. He's very charismatic. He makes you feel really good. Yeah. I don't even can't say that I can judge his heart, but um, it's just very clear that he, he's not always being honest with, with people publicly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had experiences face to face with Elder Holland as well. Went to a meeting in Ohio where he was at. And uh, at this time, I'm still wanting to make it work so bad, trying to find a way to believe in this stuff. And I walk up to the front because we had had conversation. I told him I would be there. And he said, come find me, come, you know, come, come seek me out. I went up to the front to shake his hand. He, he grabbed my ear and said, oh, the famous Bill Real. And my wife was standing right next to me. So she can vouch that that happened. Um, but yes, to your face, it's niceness, but away from you, right? You get the taffy pulling experience. So to your face, like it's okay to doubt. It's okay to have questions. And then on the other hand, when he gets into a private conversation in a regional conference with a bunch of kids, it's okay to mock people who have questions. It's okay to mock people who have doubts. And so when you start to see the bipolar-ness uh, of Elder Holland, um, it, it becomes stressing. It becomes concerning. And you begin to see that this guy is one person um, when he needs to be. But in reality, I think he's somebody entirely, uh, he's entirely somebody else. And I'm just going to say I had a very similar situation where I met with him he reassures me that he wants people like us in the church, that he understands people like us in the church. And then he gave that Book of Mormon talk where he said, if you leave the church, you have to crawl under, over, around the Book of Mormon, as if to taunt and mock 
uh, people who struggle with the Book of Mormon. And it, it, it was very duplicitous. So I actually think you've hit on something very important. I think Elder Holland is misleading people and being dishonest. And uh, I think he needs to be held accountable for that. Yeah. And we now live in a world where our scholars are now pointing to the Book of Mormon, the Book of Abraham, and other translation productions as pseudopigrapha. Richard Bushman himself has said these translation productions are pseudopigrapha. So this whole crawling around the Book of Mormon no longer is necessary. All you have to do is be interested in knowing the truth and to start reading. And for those who don't know what the word pseudopigrapha means, we'll be covering it with David Bakavoy uh, in early December. Uh, but it basically means writing as if you're someone in the past trying to stay faithful to what they would have written. Like and I, Nephi, having been born of goodly parents. Even if you're not Nephi, um, right. you're Joseph Smith writing uh, that. Right. And, uh, you know, some apologists are starting to wonder if the Book of Mormon isn't really a translation, but instead is Joseph Smith writing as if he were Nephi, writing as if he were Mormon, as if he were Moroni. Uh, and that's where this word inspired. It's Joseph's greatest revelation instead of Joseph's translation. This comes from Spencer Flume in the Maxwell Institute. The church is now trying to do a bait and switch where instead of claiming the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham are translations, they're now claiming that they're revelations, meaning Joseph's channeling this directly from God, and there's actually no translation happening at all. And notice I said, uh, I don't know what it was, a couple months ago, that I, I knew there was a 10 to 20 year plan to do that. And, and Dan Peterson and others said, no way. And the reality is, if you've watched over the last few months, you've seen several talks, uh, seminars, different things said by Stephen Harper, Matt Groh, and others that is absolutely now framing this as we're going to slowly let go of the word translation and we're going to slowly move into using the word revelation and that switch is happening. Really quick, we've got about 227 live watchers on our Facebook feed. That's fantastic. I just want to make a call out to our listeners um, both now and in the future. Please share this on your wall. It would be so amazing to get three or 400 people and just say, Hey, Bishop Bishop uh, Bill Real is being excommunicated for holding the church accountable, uh, for um, asking the church questions that it can't answer, for uh, calling out uh, dishonest things Elder Holland is saying. You know, please join in. If we could get three to four hundred people watching this interview today, this morning, that could really not only help uh, show you more support, Bill but also really help bring attention to the problem. So I'm just going to ask everyone now who's listening to please share this interview on their wall, in Facebook groups that they're a part of, in email, share it with everyone, because if we don't lift up our voices, um, you know, there, there won't be uh, openness and awareness uh, to the problems that are going on and, and positive things won't, won't ever happen. 